everybody. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, it's a pleasure to have all of you here again in, a CINI, in our CINI webinar. Um, today is a special day for me because um, we have a fantastic scientist here uh, that's going to deliver a, a talk for us about perovskite solar cells for two reasons. Um, Professor Yana is a, is a good friend and also a brilliant scientist. It's amazing um, her achievements uh, in the last years. So let me uh, say some few words about Professor Yana Vanzoff. She's actually the moment she's chair of the Emerging Electronic Technologies mm -hmm. at the Techno University of Dresden in Germany. Uh, so let's say about her career. So Yana received the bachelor degree in electrical engineer. I didn't know that it was an engineer, Yana. I was surprised. Uh, from Techno, uh, Techno Israel Institute of Technology in Israel in 2006. Uh, the master also in electrical engineer from Princeton University in USA in 2008. In 2011, she received the PhD in physics from University of Cambridge in UK. But Yana, uh, prior to uh, commencing her current position in Dresden uh, in 2019, Yana was a, a postdoc in uh, the Cavendish Laboratory, also in Cambridge, and assistant professor in Heidelberg University in Germany. So Yana is a recipient of a number of fellowships and awards, including the ERC Starting Grant, the Gordon Hu Fellowship, Henry Kressel Fellowship, the Fulbright Award, and the Walter Kalkoff Rose Memorial Prize. So it's such an amazing curriculum, Yana, in such a very short period of time. I'm very, very impressed. And her research uh, at the moment uh, lies in the field of emerging photovoltaics, uh, not only in perovskites, but also in organic and in quantum dot solar cells. So Yana is a Really a pleasure for me to have you here with us at uh, here at CINI webinar. Hope to see you soon. I hope so that in uh, February in Italy. <laughs> oh, and the stage is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the invitation, first of all. It's really a pleasure for me to participate in this webinar and also for the fantastic introduction. I'm really you know, quite flattered by, <laughs> by everything you said. Um, and it is, you mentioned, we've been working on emerging photovoltaic technologies. And in my group, we look at different types of technologies. Uh, but today, I will really talk about perovskites. So let me then share with you my talk that I will give today. So what I want to um, talk today uh, about is, oh, is it working? Yeah, is about the um, strategies that we developed in my lab to increase the efficiency of inverted architecture perovskite solar cells. And as you can see already a little bit from this image, it's actually about one of the steps that is being used for the fabrication of these devices that is key uh, for increasing the performance. So for those of you who are not familiar with perovskite solar cells, I will very briefly introduce this material class and also the general architecture of the device so perovskite is actually not a material, it's a crystal structure, which uh, follows the formula of ABX3. And in the case of perovskites, which are of interest to photovoltaics, in the A site, we typically have an organic cation uh, like methyl ammonium or foramidinium, or an inorganic one like cesium. In the B site, for the most part, uh, it's occupied by lead, but in some particular compositions, it can also be tin. And in the X side, we have a halide ion, so iodine, bromide, or chloride. And the reason that these materials are so fantastic for photovoltaic application is that they have many of the properties we want from our ideal um, solar cell. First of all, they are highly absorbing, which means you can make thin films and still um, catch a lot of the, of the sunlight. Their properties in terms of electron hole diffusion lengths are really quite remarkable. It's on the range of one micrometer, which is uh, um, very promising. They also show high charge carrier mobilities, which means charges that are generated can be very easily extracted at the extraction layers. 
Um, but perhaps the two properties which are the most amazing are that they have a low energetic disorder, which means if you compare the sharpness of the absorption onset uh, of perovskite materials, it's as sharp as um, gallium arsenide. And this sharpness of the absorption edge is termed the Urbach energy. And so it's um, really interesting that you can have a perovskite material which is deposited in a very simple way by solution and yet it has the same high quality optical properties like a single crystalline material like gallium arsenide moreover they also have a very high internal luminescence efficiency and that means that their combination in these materials is very low and all of these properties are there despite the fact that as i mentioned they can be processed from solution and really annealed at very low temperature. So usually it's below 100 degrees. Now to utilize all of these properties in a photovoltaic device, we have to integrate the perovskite into a device structure. So you can see a typical device structure here where the perovskite layer is our active layer and it's sandwiched between extraction layers and typically sometimes also charge blocking layers. So if you think of extraction layers, there are two possible architectures. On the one hand, it's possible to create the so-called standard architecture where electrons will be extracted at the bottom um, electrode and holes at the top, or the inverted architecture where holes are collected at the bottom and electrons at the top. And you can see that the performance, it has been evolving for both architectures. So you can see here the standard architecture in stars, um, including the current record of uh, 25.5%. Um, but if you follow the inverted architecture, which has been introduced later in time, it is continuously lagging behind in terms of the performance uh, uh, as compared to the standard architecture. And you will notice here in the moons, I did add one in red, which is our contribution to this chart. And um, I want to tell you about how we achieved that. So for us, one of the key steps, as I already mentioned, for improving the performance of photo photovoltaic devices is to look at the fundamentals of how we're actually making these materials. So how are perovskite layers made? So I already told you about the crystal structure and the composition. And so by processing them from solution, you would first stop, start by creating a precursor solution. So you will put all of your precursor materials. And then you typically, especially in the laboratory setting, you would spin code such a layer. So the vast majority of perovskite um, uh, layers for, for various research, also for photovoltaics as well as light emitting diodes, are still deposited by spin coating, where the deposition is actually done via the so-called solvent engineering step. So how does it work? We start by spin coating our perovskite precursor solution. And at a certain point during this spin coating procedure, we are applying an anti-solvent. And then that triggers the extraction of the host solvent of our uh, perovskite precursor solution and triggers the crystallization. And so we finally complete the um, crystallization by an additional annealing step at the end. And this antisolvent step has been already investigated in literature by uh, many people. And people looked at, of course, the effect of the choice of antisolvent. They also examined the volume of the antisolvent that one would need to use um, from which height you are dripping this antisolvent? Are you using a room temperature antisolvent or a hot or maybe a cold one? Uh, and also at which atmosphere you are depositing it. Another parameter that has been explored is at which point during the spin coating procedure you should be applying your antisolvent. But we found out that there is actually another very important parameter that dictates much more than the rest. Um, what happens in terms of crystallization um, and, and the properties of your perovskite layer. And that is the duration of this step, basically for how long is the antisolvent actually interacting with your um, precursor solution of the perovskite. So to investigate that, what we had done is we looked at 14 different antisolvents because we really wanted to look at a very broad range of antisolvents, some of which have already been used in literature and some of which have never. Uh, been investigated so far. And we wanted to vary the duration of time uh, for which the antisolvent is being applied to, to the perovskite precursor solution. And that's actually pretty simple. All you have to do is you have to use two different sizes of pipette tips. 
So you could imagine that if you take a pipette tip with a relatively low volume, so something like 250 microliters, to dispense the same amount of volume of antisolvent, in our case it's 200 microliters, will take you longer simply to push the piston down from the uh, pipette. It will take you longer than it would if you were to use a larger pipette tip with 1,000 microliters. And we indeed quantify these durations. So for slow antisolvent application, it's approximately 1.3 seconds, while if you do it fast, then it's uh, below 0.2 seconds. But we keep all other parameters the same. So we always use the same volume. We always work at room temperature. All the processing is done inside the same dry box and always five seconds before the end of the spin coating uh, procedure. And what we discovered is that the antisolvents behave very differently. So first of all, what we categorize as type 1 antisolvents, these are all the alcohols. In that case, you can see I'm showing you here devices that have been fabricated. Um, and in black, we have the data for fast antisolvent application. In red, we have the slow one. And you can clearly see that the fast application is superior. So just by changing how quickly we are dispensing our antisolvent, um, we significantly improve the performance of devices. This is particularly clear for the case of ethanol, you can see that if you do it slowly, you are left with very, very poorly performing devices. But if you do it fast, actually the performance is quite reasonable. Now, the second category of devices, what we call type two, and these are all the antisolvents shown here. It doesn't really matter if you do it fast or slow, the performance of the devices is quite similar. And maybe the only clear outlier would be antisolvent 4, and you would say, well, here actually slow is worse than fast. And later I will exactly explain to you why that happens, because actually antisolvent 4 falls somewhere in between category 1 and category 2. Now, finally, the type 3 antisolvents, which are shown here, the opposite occurs. If you deposit them slowly, you get high performance devices. While if you deposit them fast, you will see that not only the performance significantly drops, but also the distribution in performance is very high. And you will see later why that happens. And particularly remarkable is the case of mesethylene, where, where you do deposit it fast, it simply doesn't work at all. You can't make any functional devices. But if you were to do it slowly, then you actually see that um, very reasonable performance can be achieved. And that already shows us that by controlling the speed of the antisolvent application, it is possible to make high efficiency devices from essentially any antisolvent. We just need to understand these interactions. So let's look more closely at what happens with each type of antisolvent. So in type one, so this I remind you, these are the alcohols. What we observe is that if we deposit it fast, we have you know, good quality perovskite films with large uniform grains. Um, you can see in the cross section that, you know, the films look okay, but we do have some excess of lead iodide on the surface. And this is, um, you can always observe it in SEM if you have these white crystallites on the surface of your perovskite film. Now, if you do it slowly, what you first of all observe is that there is a significantly um, larger amount of excess lead iodide on the surface. You also sometimes observe small pinholes which are formed. And in uh, various cases, these voids at the interface to the whole extracting layer PTA. And so you, you really have a microstructure which is not ideal uh, in case you do it slowly. And this is also uh, consistent with uh, 2D XRD measurements, which show specifically that if you do it slowly, you have a significantly larger uh, signal from the lead iodide uh, than if you do it fast. Now let's look at type 2 antisolvents, where no matter if you deposit it fast or slow, you always have very similar microstructure. You have a small amount of lead iodide access on the surface, no pinholes or voids. And so for these types of antisolvents, no matter how you deposit it, you are going to end up with high performance devices. Now, um, this is again confirmed by 2D XRD measurements, where in all cases we have uh, strong signals from the perovskite crystal structure and only very, very minor contribution from the lead iodide. 
Now, for type 3 antisolvents, actually, there's no need to do a lot of complicated microscopy because the difference can be seen just by eye. So here I give you an example of anisole, which is a type 2 antisolvent. And you can see that if you do it fast or slow, it doesn't matter. Both films are um, show complete coverage and are black. So they, you have perovskite deposited everywhere. But for the type 3 antisolvents, you clearly see that only the slow deposition results in complete film coverage, while the uh, fast deposition typically results in a perovskite formation only in the central spots. This is particularly clear here in the mesothelium case. So only where you were dripping your antisolvent from your pipette and the interaction time was the longest, only there you actually have a perovskite film and in the surrounding areas you have very poor coverage um, and, and sometimes no perovskite at all. So, but we still examined um, the structure of what we get. So first of all, in the fast, we only look at the central spot. So where perovskite was actually formed. And there we see that that central spot is typically a high quality perovskite. We do observe um, pinholes for toluene, but apart from that, if we think of the other antisolvents, we actually have that central area is a high quality film. It's just not fully covering our sa sample. While if we do it slowly, again, we are back to large uniform grains with only a small axis of radiated on the surface, and we don't observe any microstructural flaws like pinholes or voids. This is again confirmed by 2D XRD measurements, where by looking at the structure at that central spot in films that were deposited fast, um, you see that again, we have the diffraction peaks of the perovskite. And so we somehow are able to form the perovskite only in that area. While if we do it slowly, then everywhere uh, across the entire area, we have a high quality perovskite with uh, the crystalline structure that we can see here. So looking at these three categories, we try to um, understand what causes the different solvents to behave so differently. So we looked at the typical properties of solvents, like their density or the boiling point or the dipole moment, but we couldn't find anything um, very consistent because you would have, you know, in the same category, high boiling point solvents, but also low boiling point solvents, or you would have high dipoles, but also low dipoles and densities. So nothing seemed to make uh, sense about why would the solvents behave so differently. And so we realized that to understand that, we really need to simulate the situation of what happens when we deposit our film. So as I mentioned, we create a perovskite precursor solution and we are spin coating that. And as the uh, precursor solution spread around and we have this liquid film of the precursor um, precursors of the perovskite, we are adding our antisolvent. And the solvents for the precursor solution are typically the MF, the MSO, and so we're adding an antisolvent. And here I will show you a simulation of such a situation uh, that is done just in a vial. So we took one of the precursors, in our case, this is MAI. We dissolve it in the host solvent system, the MF, the MSO, and then we top it up with each antisolvent and we chose the volume ratio of one to six because we know that the volume of our antisolvent is 200 microliters while we estimate that the volume of this thin down liquid film of perovskite precursors is about a sixth of that. And so here you can directly see that indeed the antisolvents behave very differently depending on their category. So let's first examine the um, alcohols, so type 1 antisolvents. We see, first of all, that MAI is fully soluble in these antisolvents. And more than that, we also see that the whole solvent system, the MF, the MSO, and the antisolvent are miscible. And we can see that because we do not observe any liquid-liquid interface being formed in this category of uh, solvents. On the other hand, type 2 antisolvents, they uh, do not allow MAI to be, so their MAI is not soluble in them. And the only outlier is antisolvent 4, which maybe you remember I mentioned lies somewhere in between type 1 and type 2 because you can see here that the amount of residual MAI in the solution is much lower, which means it's partially soluble. But because some, um, some of this residual amount remained, we actually categorized it as type two, even though it lies somewhere in between type one and type two. Now, MAI is not soluble, as I mentioned, but also the MFD, MSO, and the antisolvent are still miscible. Again, we do not observe that they 
uh, separate. But we do observe it for type 3 antisolvents, where we clearly see that there is a liquid-liquid interface between the DMF, DMSO, and the uh, antisolvent that we're adding in. So how are these observations helping us to understand what's going on? So when we're depositing our antisolvent onto our liquid perovskite film with all the precursors, it has still the whole solvent, the MF, the MSO. It has organic halides, MAI, FAI, but also, of course, the other components. But they are not so um, influencing what is happening, so I'm just going to keep them out of the discussion. If it's a type 1 antisolvent, as we are depositing the antisolvent, because the DMF and DMSO are miscible with the antisolvent, they can be efficiently extracted, right? So they can cross across this liquid-liquid interface of the DMF, DMSO, and the antisolvent and be removed. But in addition to that, MAI and FAI can also be removed. And so if you do that and you do it too slowly, you will... Um, change the composition of your perovskite film because you're going to lose some of these organic halides that you need in order to form the perovskite. And so if you do it fast, then you lose essentially no or, or very little of these organic halides. And then you have a high quality perovskite film with only a small amount of lead iodide at the surface. But if you do it slowly, you're going to lose so much of these organic halides that there will be not enough of them to actually form a high quality perovskite. And so you will end up with a much larger amount of lead iodide on the surface and also poor microstructure like voids and, um, and pinholes. Now, if you do it with a type 2 antisolvent here, these antisolvents are still miscible with DMF and DMSO, so they can extract the host antisolvents, but they, um, uh, the MAI and FAI are not soluble in them, and so you have no concern to lose um, uh, the organic halides. And so it doesn't matter if you do it fast or slow, you will always end up with a high quality perovskite film. And finally, in the case of type 3 antisolvent here, um, the biggest problem is that the MF, the MSO and the antisolvent are not miscible. And so if you do it too fast, there is simply not enough time to actually extract the whole solvents and trigger the crystallization of the perovskite film. And so you end up with perovskite formation only at the very central spot where you uh, pipe it at your antisolvent. Well, if you do it slowly, then there is sufficient amount of time to have the MF and DMSO slowly diffuse and be extracted out, and then you can have a high quality perovskite film. Now, this is also relevant for other compositions of perovskite. So here we are looking at an MA3 composition, which is um, now I would say one of the most common ones because it leads to much better uh, stability of the devices. And here you can see that what used to be a type 1 antisolvent, in this case IPA, is no longer type 1 because um, actually FAI is not well soluble in IPA, only MAI is well soluble. And so once you change the composition, you need to be careful which antisolvent you are using because it might actually be in a different category than the one described in, uh, in our work. Now type 2, for example TFT, remains the same because again it's uh, the organic halides are not soluble in it and the miscibility is good so it remains type 2 and in the case of type 3 again toluene these will remain type 3 even if you change the process composition because it's related to the miscibility with the DMF DMSO. Now beyond the fact that you uh, are able to deposit perovskite uh, films and high quality and form high quality devices from any antisolvent what we also show is that uh, the correct choice of the speed of an antisolvent application can actually influence the processability window of your perovskite so if we look here at the effect of stoichiometry so we're looking at the triple cation mixed halide perovskite right so we're using cesium fama and a mixed halide composition here and what we're doing is we are varying the either the deficiency or the access of this organic halide, so MA and FA. And um, as a result, we're basically varying either from a situation where we have deficiency in organic cations, which is equivalent to some lead access, or alternatively, we have access of the organic cations and some deficiency of lead. And if we follow the evolution of the performance, we can see that there is a much broader processability window for high performing devices if you are using the fast application. And in this case, this is for a anisole, which is a type two antisolvent. Um, 
What also we observe is that the best performance is actually observed for the perfectly stoichiometric devices. And this is um, very different to what is happening in literature where for the most part, I would say 95% of, of all researchers always add lead iodide excess. So they add lead excess and they basically operate in this regime where there is a small excess of lead iodide. And we believe that this has occurred not because the devices are better in this regime, but rather there is a better reproducibility in this regime because researchers with different speeds of the solvent application end up with the same performance. While in the case of a deficiency of lead iodide, only those who do it fast have a high performing device and those who happen to do it slowly end up with a lower performance. But the best performance is still achieved for the perfect histogeometric um, composition. So one thing that troubled us a little bit is that if we look at, for example, type 2 antisolvents, we still observe that there is excess lead diodide at the surface. And that doesn't fully make sense considering we are working with the perfect composition. We don't add any excess lead diodide to our precursor solution. So we wanted to understand why this happens uh, because it suggests that this antisolvent step actually changes the composition that we intended to have by still removing some organic cations from the perovskite, even though they are mostly insoluble in, uh, in the antisolvent. And so to, to, to look at, at that more closely and also to find a solution, we actually decided to look at what will happen if we change the way we deposit the antisolvent. So typically it's done by pipetting, as I've shown you before, but instead we can also just spray it. And this way we can uh, expose the film to a mist of small droplets of the antisolvent rather than pipetting a large volume uh, on top. And what we observe, first of all, that indeed, if you compare the films created by pipetting, and here I show you two different antisolvent volumes, 60 microliters and 200, 200 microliters, you clearly observe these additional crystallites of lead iodide form, and they are typically hexagonal in shape, so you can easily recognize them. And if you just spray the same volume of antisolvent onto the films, you can see that there are significantly fewer of those lead iodide um, crystallites that are formed. This is also confirmed by GVAX measurements, where we could look at the uh, fraction of lead iodide, both at the surface of the films as well as in the bulk. And you can see that consistently, both in the surface and in the bulk, the pipetted films result in much larger amounts of lead iodide formation than sprayed films. If we look at the photovoltaic performance, we see that indeed we are gaining approximately 1% in absolute uh, numbers of device efficiency when we are spraying the antisolvent instead of uh, pipetting it. Moreover, those of you who perhaps work with uh, pipetting of antisolvent, you know that you need a relatively large volume, two, 300 microliters to actually have a high quality film. While if you use a smaller volume like 60 microliter, exact, exactly this happens and the performance is reduced because it's not enough to actually expose the entire film to, to the antisolvent. On the other hand, when you spray it, you see that it no longer matters how much antisolvent you are using, even as little as 60 microliters is enough because you are creating this mist of droplets which lands onto your film and not just an individual spot where you're depositing all of your antisolvent. So why is spraying better? We believe that um, the fact that we are spraying the antisolvent and we have this, uh, these small droplets which are landing onto our substrate, this limits how much MAI and FAI can be removed essentially unintentionally from your perovskite film. And that way we can preserve the stoichiometry much, much better. Moreover, because we have many droplets with a larger surface area, the antisolvent can then evaporate much faster than this very large volume deposited by pipetting. And so based on these um, combination of these effects, we are ending up with a better film quality and as a result, also a better photovoltaic performance. Now, the final part of the story I want to tell you is that if we are already going to use the antisolvent to form our perovskite film, why not also add an additional aspect, so passivation or functionalization via the antisolvent? So here is something I want to show you. This is a, our newest work uh, together with uh, my great friend and colleague, Julia Grancini. And 
we wanted to develop a strategy how we can use uh, cations that are typically used for 2D perovskites uh, in a strategy to modify interfaces in inverted uh, architecture devices. And so here we look at these uh, PI cations and we have a series of three, um, the basic PI cation as well as the two allogenated derivatives. And what we do is that we are depositing them into the uh, device in two different positions. So first of all, uh, typically, depending on the architecture you use, of course, but typically when you deposit your perovskite solution on a hole extracting layer, which is what would happen for an inverted architecture device, the withability of the perovskite solution is rather poor. And so you have to do what's called a DMF pre-wash step. So basically DMF is one of the solvents uh, that is being used for perovskite. And by already spin coating DMF onto your uh, whole extracting layer, you're increasing the solubility or uh, the, sorry, the withability of the perovskite solution. And so to modify that bottom interface, we actually added the PI cation into the DMF, into this pre-wash step. Then we deposit our perovskite layer as usual, but we add the PI cations into the antisolvent. Then we are completing our device by annealing. And first of all, this means that we are only using steps that are already relevant to the device. So there's no additional fabrication step that is added. And it also allows us to investigate essentially, you know, four different types of devices. Of course, the reference device with no modifications, the HTL, sorry, the whole transport layer modifier device uh, where we deposit the PI cation only at the bottom or separately the ETL modified device where we are modifying the interface between the perovskite and the PCBM. And of course we can combine the two approaches and use uh, both bottom and top modification of the perovskite layer. So let's look first of all, what happens if you use the PI cation in the DMF wash step and modify the whole transporting layer PTA? You observe no change in the VOC but a minor change in the current, in the short circuit current, and a very significant increase in the fill factor. And so overall, the performance is indeed increased if you are adding this, uh, these cations at the bottom. And why does this happen? When you are depositing your perovskite film with just the DMF wash, you do end up with some voids at the uh, interface to the PTA and also some uh, pinholes that can be formed. And this is because the wettability, even on this DMF washed PTA film, is still not great. And so you have these structural defects. On the other hand, when you use either PEI or chloro PEI or fluoro PEI as a um, cation in this DMF wash, you can see that the microstructure is significantly improved and these uh, defects or voids are no longer formed. Now, we wanted to confirm that when we are doing this DMF wash, we indeed leave some of the cations behind. And this we did by looking at XPS measurements. So you can see in the case of the reference, we have a carbon signal coming from the PTA polymer and nitrogen, of course, but we don't have any fluorine, chlorine, or iodine signal. While once we deposit the um, A cations or this uh, PI cations in the DMF washing step, we see that we have an additional nitrogen signal from the PI, as well as the iodine, of course. And in the case of the halogenated um, cations, we have either a chlorine or a fluorine signal. And that confirms that indeed, when we are creating this DMF uh, washing step, some of the cations remain on the surface. And as a result, they significantly modify the wettability of the perovskite solution. So here you can see really pictures on a spin coder. If you were to deposit your perovskite solution only on a DMF washed substrate, you can see that there is a relatively poor wettability. While if you were to do it on a PEI modified substrate, you can see that the solution spreads much, much better. And this is indeed uh, very reasonable because these cations are very polar and so they can uh, drastically modify the wettability of the precursor solution. Now let's look what happens if you put them at the top. So that means inside the antisolvent step. So we observe a very large increase in the VOC, essentially no change in the JSC, again, an increase in the fill factor, and finally the power conversion efficiency is increasing. Now, 
because we're deposited in the antisolvent, we actually don't know where is the, where are these cations going. Are they distributed all throughout the film or only on the surface? And so what we did is we monitored the two cations which have a marker element. So this is the chlorinated and the fluorinated derivatives. And we look at the XPS signal from chlorine and fluorine, and we very gently etch the perovskite layer to see at which point the signal disappears. And so what we see is after already 20 or 30 seconds, there is no longer any signal from neither chlorine nor fluorine. And based on the etching rate of our um, material, we know that it's approximately the top one nanometer of the perovskite layer. So by uh, using the antisolvent step to add the uh, these cations onto the perovskite film, we modify purely the top surface and not the bulk of the film. But by passivating, uh, or sorry, by modifying the surface, what we do is we actually passivate defects at the surface. And you can easily uh, observe that by looking at the photoluminescence measurements of these films, you can see that the photoluminescence quantum efficiency more than doubles uh, once you use these acotions uh, inside the antisolvent. And that really explains why we have a, such a significant increase in the VOC. So, I've showed you that with an HTL modification, you can increase the current and the fill factor. And with the ETL mod uh, modification, you can increase the VOC. So our hope was that when we combine the two approaches, we should be able to increase all the photovoltaic parameters together. And indeed, this is what happened. So by doing this dual modification, um, we achieved an increase in the VOC, reaching the highest uh, number for us was uh, 1.18. Uh, we also have an increase in current, which again is reasonable considering the fact that we are eliminating voids uh, and pinholes from our perovskite layer, so we can actually extract the charges much better. We have an increase in the fill factor up to a maximum value of 85%. And finally, the power conversion efficiency is increased, reaching a, the highest value of 23.7%, and that's, uh, to the best of our knowledge, a record performance in inverted architecture. So with this, I would like to um, just conclude and say that it has been really critical for us to understand the role of the antisolvent in perovskite film formation, because by understanding the processes that occur in this step, we are able to significantly increase the performance of the devices. And I hope I convince you that by simply controlling the rate of the antisolvent application, you can fabricate high, you know, high efficiency devices from essentially any antisolvent. Um, now, if you have selected an antisolvent that you really like, um, instead of pipetting it, you should go ahead and try spraying it because it will lead to an additional boost in, the, in efficiency. And finally, um, you could apply our strategy of dual modification of um, uh, the perovskite devices, including integration of the of these cations into the antisolvent step in order to increase the device performance uh, further. So I would like to thank my group uh, and the members who have contributed the most. I've marked here in uh, blue. And of course, I also want to thank Professor Giulia Grangini for the great collaboration on the last project that I presented to you and all of our uh, funding agencies. And if you want to keep up uh, with us and find out what we are working on, then please follow us also on Twitter. And uh, I want to thank you for your attention. Thank you, Elena, for such a very nice talk. A oh, lot of a um, lot of work. And so um, we have some questions here on, on YouTube. Um, I think we can place a question here, but otherwise I can read for you here. OK, there is a question from Lucas Polimanti. Um, Yana, thank you for your presentation. The question is, uh, did you, uh, which parameter did you use to define the fast and the slow? Mm -hmm. And your system uh, have this kind of adjust adjustable speed of the position? Yeah, so we did it in a very simple way. We simply used two different uh, pipette sizes. So one was one with a pipette tip of 250 microliter which if you think about it, that means that your solvent is filled up higher up and it will just take you longer to push the piston down to dispense it. And the other one was the 1000 microliter where you could do it really, really quickly. 
And of course, we would love to have an automated system for dispensing the antisolvent with adjustable speed. Um, but I actually looked into that and it's way too expensive to implement on a, on a lab scale. But we have learned that now that we are aware of how important the speed is, we can actually control it really well because it's about you know being aware of it. And I think until now, um, mostly people didn't have, you know didn't consider this as an important parameter. And so it varied between batch to batch for the same student. It also varied between different students because naturally different people will just dispense the antisolvent with uh, um, with a different speed. Uh, but you are right. If uh, this technology would ever have to go to an industrial setting, of course, we need a system uh, which is automated and very reproducibly dispensing the antisolvent with the same speed. Uh, the next question is from uh, Dr. Hagen. Uh, a very fruitful presentation on ProScat. Sienna, was there information of 2D ProScat on using PI in the solve? Uh, that's also my question because you are like working, uh, you're balancing preservation with 2D formation. Can you comment on that? Exactly. So this is a great question. We also looked very hard to find some 2D ProScat. And so all I could say is to the best of our knowledge, there isn't one. Or at the very least, it's so thin that we have no method to detect it yet. So you don't see it in XRD, you don't see it in any of the optical characterization. And um, I believe based on our etching experiments that because the uh, the actual um, presence of the acotion, so the chlorine and the fluorine signal is only in the top one nanometer, most likely what is happening is that you are adding it into the antisolvent. It really passivates the top surface but it's not enough to really form a 2D perovskite. And the second um, sort of reason that I think it doesn't really form is that if we assume it did form, typically 2D perovskite would have a much larger band gap and that will suppress electron extraction. And for us, the top surface is where we collect the electrons to the PCBM. And so what would happen is that if there were a 2D perovskite formed, we will lose some of our current most likely but we don't observe that. So that's why we think we have pure passivation without to deformation. But it's a great question. It's something we really also looked into um, very deeply. Do you remember, Iana, the, the concentration that we're using in this solution now? Can you remember? Um, I think at the top, it was very low. I think it's something like five uh, uh, millimolar. It's really, really low. Okay. It, it's um, definitely in the paper. So you, you know, all the details are out there where we, we don't hide anything. <laughs> um, but continue with this um, with this uh, part of your talk, Ayana. Uh, I have a question. So, so considering the PI, you are just uh, changing the alight in the structure of the, in the benzene ring. Okay, you go from fluoride, chloride, and iodide. So, and you see improvement in like all parameters when have this uh, substitution. VOC. Yeah the factor and current. So what's, can you comment the, the fact of this different and uh, allied, what is actually is in exactly. the, uh, can you get alignment in this, whatever? So so we what we observe is typically the halogenated derivatives. So the fluorine and the, and the chlorinated ones are actually pretty similar. The fluorinated typically outperforms the other two. And the PEI is somewhere like in between the reference and the other one. So FPI is really the best one we observe. Mm -hmm. I think also my chlorine is also very close. And we looked into why would that happen? And what we believe is happening is that the solubility of these cations in the antisolvent is slightly different. And that means that when you are actually depositing your antisolvent onto your film, a slightly different amount of each A cation will be left. And indeed, so basically, as you if you, if you think of solubility, um, as the antisolvent dries up, right, the A cation will crush out of solution and will remain on the surface of the perovskite film. And so it's actually the cation with um, the lowest solubility that will crush out first, and so more of it will remain on the surface of the film. And the halogenated derivatives have a lower solubility than the PEI. And so that's the reason why a halogenated derivative in the end ends up with a much higher photovoltaic performance, simply because more of these defects can be passivated because more of the material actually remains on the top surface. 
but there is no other variation in terms of, of course, we were considering, you know, uh, it has a different dipole, it has other properties, but on terms of the electronic structure, we looked uh, in detail with UPS and we observed no changes. So it's purely an effect of there is more of it, and so it does more good. But this uh, links with the first part of your talk when you're changing the you have type one, two, or three of the solvent. So it doesn't matter the physical properties of the solvent, like boiling points and and, and and another density, for instance. What is really important is actually the miscibility. Yeah, the miscibility and the solubility, exactly. Yeah. Okay, I think you have more questions. Uh, the next one is from Lucas. Um, thanks for amazing presentation, Yana. Have you performed any stability tests on this process and prepare with different solvents? Um, yes, we did actually. Um, uh, it's in the SI of the paper if you want to look in more detail. But the general observation uh, was that a high quality film and a high quality device will be also more stable, right? So, for example, devices where we used the antisolvent speed, which wasn't the ideal one, for example, slow for uh, type 1 or fast for type 3 they had these microstructural defects, right? They had voids and they had some, um, some pinholes. And actually these microstructural defects is where much of the degradation will commence. And so indeed those poorly performing devices also ended up being uh, less stable. And so you sort of kill two birds with one shot. If you are able to improve the efficiency of your device, you very typically also end up with a much more stable device. And I would also comment that in terms of the stability of the dual modified devices, uh, they are much more stable than the ones which are not modified. And so again, you end up with an increased efficiency and stability at the same time. I have a very interesting question from Dr. Agnaldo Gonçalves. It makes sense to alternate the deposition of the perovskite solution and then solvent both by spray and then repeat the cycle until we desire the until we get the desired perovskite film thickness? Um, so it's an interesting idea. Spray deposition of perovskites is also something that is being uh, looked into. We don't really do it, but uh, um, I know that in literature there's a lot of interest in that because it is fully applicable to large area fabrication. Um, the issue, of course, with spraying, especially on an industrial setting or large-scale fabrication, is just the sheer volume of solvents that you need. And so I think on a lab scale, spin coating still beats spraying because otherwise, you know, you would just spray huge amounts of DMF everywhere. Um, I don't think you can really do it uh, by repeating the cycle multiple times because you could imagine that, you know, you sprayed your first perovskite precursor solution, then you spray the antisolvent, you now have a perovskite layer. If you were to spray that with a new precursor solution, it has the DMF solvent. So you would have redissolved whatever you just made for the next step. So unfortunately, um, fabrication of multi layers, which is what maybe you're suggesting here, uh, by solution processing in perovskite is very tricky. Um, and so I'm, I, I don't really see that happening. But I do agree with you that it could be interesting to test spraying of perovskite uh, solutions with spraying of the antisolvent. Uh, I think we have one more. Thank you, Anna. One more question from Dr. Hanjan here. Oh, no, it's Luca. OK, Dr. Hanjan. Um, thank for the explanation to D. What's the solvent spray at uh, only one go or try multiple times? And how can control the quantity of the solvent? Okay, so uh, we tested both the uh, single spray as well as actually, I just want to mention that in case you are interested in trying it out, we don't use any complicated system. We don't have a carrier gas spraying gun, nothing. It's literally a little spraying, uh, exactly like a little spraying for, you know, for perfume and for, for kids. Um, you just use one of those. And what you can do is you can spray multiple times. So indeed, this is one way to control the volume you're depositing. And this works, you know, pretty well. We try twice and three times. It works really well. Um, and another way to vary the volume you're depositing is simply by taking your, your um, spraying bottle higher up, right? So you could imagine when you spray, you have a cone that 
spreads, right? And so if your sample is very small, the further away you are, the cone is larger. And so the uh, overall volume of antisolvent deposited on the sample is smaller and smaller. And so that's those are the two key parameters you can um, change. And so what, what we did is, I think, for the 200 microliters, we were close and spray twice. And for the 60 microliters, we were slightly further away and just once. And so you could modify. Um, but the interesting part is our observation is that once you spray, the actual volume doesn't really play a role anymore because you create this mist. And so you no longer need this very large volume of antisolvent to coat your entire film to trigger the crystallization. But rather you could imagine it as like it's rain, right? And so when it's, once it's raining, it no longer matters how much, you know, you're going to get wet. And so uh, same with the perovskite film. Um, it's no longer so critical to determine the exact volume of the, of the sprayed antisolvent. Okay, Jana. So again, thank you very much for your presence here at the CNE webinar. It was a really pleasure to have you here with us today. I hope to see you soon. Yes. And I would like to thank the, all the participants of the CNE webinar. Uh, just uh, one point here, our... Um, Yana's talk is going to be, you, you can find uh, Yana's talk on our uh, YouTube channel. And also follow us in our social media, um, Twitter, uh, Instagram, and Facebook. And see you soon in the next uh, CME webinar. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Thank Bye. you. Bye-bye. Have a nice talk. Congratulations.